I'm on a work trip to San Diego. There's a very good customer of mine who usually sells me extremely rare books and documents. Apparently has some unique finds he wants me to check out. And one of them is supposed to be a handwritten letter by George Washington about the Whiskey Rebellion. I cannot lie. I love anything about the OG GW. Wow. Adam. Hey, Rick. How's it going? I'm pretty good. Um, I love the vault door. I mean, did, did they keep the Holy Grail in here at one time? Uh, it's actually in uh, 9020, but, <laughs> but I lost the key to that box. Speaking of Holy Grails, I brought you three Holy Grails, three real treasures. The first one is a painting from a medieval book of hours from about 1430. In the 19th century and the 20th century, the miniature paintings inside were recognized as true works of art in and of themselves. I know the Book of Hours was probably the most popular book in the Middle Ages. Religion was very, very important. And it was also a status symbol just having a book because they were literally done by hand. And they were so prized and revered, they were even given as dowry gifts. It's so rare to see illuminations like this. This one is really well executed. So the big question, how much you want for it? I was going to ask $12,000. Well, maybe there's a package deal to be done. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll show you the other stuff. So this is the Book of Games by Edmund Hoyle. It's printed in Philadelphia in 1796. And that makes it the first book on card games printed in America. Here we have whist, quadrille, piquette, backgammon, chess, billiards, and tennis. So four-sevenths of it, I know. Well, I'm not going to lower the price on you just because you don't know what piquet or quadrille is. I can tell you that. OK. Well, just like the leave, $12,000. I'm assuming you're leaving the best for last. I am. So this is a very important letter signed on September 15th, 1792, in George Washington's hand, having to do with the Whiskey Rebellion. Oh, OK. Um, most people in this country don't know about the Whiskey Rebellion, which is like a really important part of American history. I mean, George Washington's in office, all of a sudden, Congress passes a tax on whiskey. The people in western Pennsylvania really thought it was unfair. It got to the point where people were dying over it. There was one tax collector that they tarred and feathered. And um, George Washington ended up massing 12,000 troops. They saw the show of force, and he was able to uh, suppress the uprising just because of that show of force. And this proclamation to enforce these taxes, he had to get it to Jefferson as quick as possible as Secretary of State to sign it. So has this been repaired? No, this has not been repaired. I mean, it would have been originally folded and then, you know, flattened out. Um, it is in rough shape. Um, here, here's the big thing. How much? 45000 OK, I, I, I do love it. There's a, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here. The condition really scares me, though. The reason I chose today to come down here is because I knew Stuart Les was going to be down. You've met him before, right? Yeah, I have. This is what he does. Sure. Uh, so let me go give him a call and get him down here, and we'll go from there. OK, you got it. All right, right back. I'm hoping that the expert goes bonkers over this unusual letter in Washington's hand. I mean, with the prices of things on the market and auction today, maybe he's going to say more than $45,000. Neat item. And so who's William Gray? So William Gray was actually George Washington's weaver. He obviously entrusted him with, you know, some important duties. So he was writing a proclamation for the Whiskey Rebellion in hand, and he needed Jefferson's signature. And he told Mr. Gray with some urgency, get this to Jefferson to sign. OK. I did bring along an example of a uh, George Washington letter, so I can compare the handwriting on this to the handwriting on this item. George Washington had the greatest handwriting of any mm -hmm. president. So if we look at it, it's definitely in Washington's handwriting. One issue with this, Rick, is obviously you can see that the G and W have eroded on here with uh, water staining and age. The signature is not that strong on the letter. Uh, the other unusual thing is the size of the paper. Usually he used paper that was much larger. So I don't know if he just was looking for a scrap of paper or if this was cut down from something larger. So. That's George Washington's signature, yep. correct? In his handwriting, and in not too good a condition. Correct. So you put that in a blender, and the price is? With other similar Washingtons that I cited, I think something like this, a fair market value would be about $20,000 on it. Hmm, that's a, a little disappointing to hear. Well, thanks, Stuart. You're the best. Nice seeing you again. Oh, great seeing you. Good luck with it, Rick. It's a great piece of American history. All right, I'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks, Rick. OK. All right.
Down to the numbers. Down to the numbers. The Washington letter, it's pretty amazing. It's really cool. I just, for my customers, it's too rough. Mm -hmm. It really is. OK, so I'm just going to pass on that. Uh, now, I'm really surprised. Wow. OK. We have these two right here, the illuminated leaf yeah. and the book. Best prices. I'll give you them both uh, for 20. I think eight and eight is much better. 16,000 for the pair, for the two. What, what about 19? I think 18,000 is a fair price for the two of them. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell you, I'm gonna agree to it, Rick, but this time it's really reluctantly. These are real treasures. Uh, they're definitely treasures. So $18,000, we got a deal. I'll send you a check, and when you get it, you can send me these. Okay. Like always, man, it's a pleasure. OK, well, thank you so much. I, you know, I, I love selling you things. You appreciate them, so all good. OK, cool. And you did check all of these, right? I'm not going to tell you the one with the diamonds. Get out of here. <laughs> How can I help you? I have a 1873 Winchester. Oh, sweet. It was from the Battle of Wounded Knee. And I got the documents to prove it. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty significant in history. Sweet. I kind of have a soft spot for the history of the West. It was just sitting there, and I figured it was time to cash it in. I'm hoping to get as much as I can, but I wouldn't take less than 60000 This is cool. What's the Battle of Wounded Knee? The Battle of Wounded Knee, or the Massacre of Wounded Knee, because that's basically what it was. It was the winter of 1890. In South Dakota, the Lakota Indians were camped out next to a river. The 7th Cavalry was going to disarm them. They went into the camp. One of the Indians did not want to give up his gun. Somewhere, a shot rang out. The 7th Cavalry started shooting like crazy. Basically, what they did is they started just massacring everybody. Um, this was the last, I think, major conflict with American Indians. The Wounded Knee Massacre was a huge screw-up by the US Army. Most of the Native Americans that were killed were not even armed, including women and children. And it's important in history because this was basically the end of the Indian Wars, which had been going on since Columbus landed here. This was carried by a Union soldier? No, no, no. This is from an Indian capture. This is the manifest. It was supposed to go along with all the guns that they took from Wounded Knee. They were supposed to go to Fort Laramie and get destroyed. All right, this is some interesting paperwork. So I'm assuming this is the certificate of authenticity. Yeah. You want to read that, chum? Yeah, let's see. The following item or items are guaranteed to be genuine, authentic, and exactly as advertised. Does that say it's the Battle of Wounded Knee? No. Nope. Anywhere, anywhere uh, on the letter. It just says taken by the Lakota Indians. So yeah, nowhere does it say the Battle of Wounded Knee. I guess what, that's what that paper's for. Let's uh, take a look at this here. Yeah, there's no mention of uh, the Battle of Wounded Knee on this either. I've been trying to get Chum to take the lead on more buys lately. So I'm letting him check out the paperwork. And the fact that this doesn't say Wounded Knee on it anywhere makes me a little suspicious. This one's seen some wear. It's been shot a lot. But it's, in general, for a 73, it's in pretty good shape. How much are you looking to get out of it? I wouldn't take less than 60000 Whoa. It's a my lot of money. <laughs> my son thinks it could be worth hundreds of thousands. I just want my buddy to look at it. I just want to make sure this was actually from the Battle of Wounded Knee. You have paperwork here. I just want to make sure everything drives correctly. All right. Okay. Yep. Here's the deal. I know it's a real Winchester, but is it tied to Wounded Knee? That's the thing that will make or break this deal. So is this the Wounded Knee Winchester you called me about? Yes, it is. Let me take a look. I've always been a fan of the American West. It's the great American story. And as a student of history, there's not a better narrative to study. Winchesters were popular with Native Americans for the same reasons they were popular with whites, because they were extremely reliable, extremely powerful, and it was just a really great gun. And most of these guns they were just traded for, correct? Well, there was even a time when the United States military actively sought to arm Native Americans, and they would obviously do so with tribes that were on good terms with the government. And also, some of them were obviously taken in battle. So they, Native Americans had guns for a long time. And the Wounded Knee Massacre was really kind of the last great event of the 19th century's Indian Wars, a really terrible moment in the history of the American West. The massacre at Wounded Knee 
Unfortunately, it was a time when attitudes toward Native Americans were still quite negative. But this was a moment when things started to shift somewhat more sympathetically towards Native Americans. If we can tie it directly to the Wounded Knee Massacre, the 7th Cavalry, the significance of the gun increases dramatically. It's much more than your standard 73 carbine. Well, let's take a look and see what we got here. So what we have here is the unserverable ordnance stores. Basically, it's a 19th century Excel worksheet. I mean, it's a sheet that's telling what they have, the serial numbers, the condition, and what they were going to do with it. Colonel James Forsyth, he was the commander of the 7th Cavalry, so that makes sense. Uh, January 3, 1891. Now, what's interesting about that particular day, after the battle took place on December 29th, the weather was terrible. As a result of a snowstorm, it wasn't until several days later that the 7th Cavalry was able to go back to the battle site and actively pick up and collect any weapons that had been discarded. A few of the other names down here, Whitside, he was a major, he was the commander of the first squadron. So most of what we're seeing here matches up. I mean, this is the names we should see, these are the dates that we should see. So on here, it's listing this gun. Can you show me that? Yeah, the 631, I think that's this 631. Let's take a look here. Okay. And then the serial number, it's, you know, it says 50423. We got a Winchester 73 carbine, 50423. All right, so you have some really good paperwork here. So now the one thing we don't have in any of this is wounded knee. Those two words are missing from everything we have on here. But given all of the information that we have, the two individuals, the dates on it, I think we can make the assumption that this gun was taken in the aftermath of the wounded knee massacre. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Aren't you gonna put a price on it? Well, I, I work at a museum, I'm not an appraiser, so I'm not gonna put a financial value on here. I was kind of hoping that you'd probably say it was worth a couple hundred thousand, <laughs> and then I could say, well, give me 60%. You know? <laughs> I'm sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great to see a Winchester 73. It is one of those kind of iconic guns of the American West, but to see one that had such good provenance makes it all the more special. All right, I'm convinced it's from the massacre at Wounded Knee. Let's talk about your price. You want way too much. You just don't get that kind of money for a gun unless there is something very, very special and it's associated with an individual. I'd give you like 14,000 bucks for it. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, yeah. if you put this in auction, you will get right around that number. Really? Mm. I got 12,000 into it. You have 12,000 into the gun. So what's the lowest number you'll go? I'd go 50. Obviously, we're not going to do any business. Um, check around. Uh, like I said, I, I really am being completely sincere with you. No, so. I, I believe you. All right, have a nice day. Thank man. you very much. This guy is off his rocker if he thinks I will pay 50 grand for that gun. Plain and simple. Hopefully, he checks around town, gets a lot of prices, and comes crawling right back to me. What do we got here? I have a World War II leather jacket worn by a real war hero. Numerous times shot down. Fighter pilots, they did not really have a long life expectancy. Mm hmm. His plane took 198 bullets, six cannon shots. Yeah, it's it uh... like a miracle to survive. I came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my World War II fighter jacket. I got the jacket from an old roommate. I have a lot of bills to pay. I'm hoping to get 10,000 bucks. I'd probably take as low as 4,000. So, what do you know about the pilot who wore this? It was sworn by Henry S. Heidekoper. When I researched it online, found out who the guy was. I said, wow, this guy was a hero. He was captain of the Hellhawks. Seriously? Mm-hmm. The Hellhawks were famous for stopping the Nazis at Normandy. Yeah. They helped soften up the beaches. These guys had to fly low. This was the plane that went over and took out tanks. Right. It really wasn't that fast, but they put a bomber engine in a fighter plane and then put eight 50 caliber machine guns in it. <laughs> and um, these guys would come across with their eight machine guns going and just tear the ground up. Right. The Hellhawks were famous for basically being a bunch of badasses. They were at D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, and they spearheaded the invasion of Germany. All right, so what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. I feel it's worth 10,000 bucks. This is a genuine military jacket. I can see that. That's easy to tell. On the back collar, actually, is 
U.S. Navy. I'm pretty sure the Hellhawks were U.S. Army Air Corps. That could very easily be an Army unit. And they just acquired some Navy jackets. It's just a little weird to me. I know a guy who will know everything about this jacket. Let me have him look at this thing. Sure. And he will tell me everything about it. Sounds great. So what are your concerns with the jacket? OK, he believes the jacket's from World War II. But as far as I know, the Hellhawks were Army Air Corps, not the Navy. There was a group called the Hellhawks that fought at Normandy. You know, they were very active in the invasion and D-Day and all of that. These guys were very successful fighters. The Hellhawks were quite involved taking out any of the German planes that got up into the air, trying to take out any of the German guns that they could, a significant part of the D-Day invasion. Yeah. It's got the Schierling collar on it. This type of weaving here is World War II with the two different types of weaving here. The patch is a World War II style of patch. Jacket itself, in terms of being World War II, everything's correct on that. In terms of Heide Cooper himself, he was in the Hellhawks. I did find him listed in the Hellhawks as a member of the unit. The problem is he was not the member of the Hellhawks that fought at Normandy. The Hellhawks is just the nickname for a group. Really? Yeah, it isn't the official name. So you also had a Marine Corps group that was VMF 213 that were the Hellhawks also in World War II. And Heide Cooper is somebody that was in VMF 213. And they were a naval air group. But it is a, a very nice World War II fighter jacket, less common than the Army fighter jackets. Thanks a lot, man. You're the best. Not a problem. Hey, Hope this Mark, helps. Appreciate the info. The squadrons get known by the nicknames, but that's not their official name. So you get some confusion when you get an overlap of the same name and two different units. Now, um, you will not get $10,000 for it. But we do have a World War II fighter jacket that I'd be willing to pay like $1,500 for. Yeah, I, I agree with you now that I know more. 10 grand is high, but uh, it's got so much history. I'd take 4,000 bucks for it. It's very interesting. The price doesn't go as much as they were a few years ago. I'll give you 2,000 cash right now. 2,500? No. No. I'd go 2,000, not a penny more. <sighs> Let's make a deal. OK. All right, meet you right up there. We'll All write right. it up. Thank you. I got to be honest, I was a little bummed when Mark told me it was from a different Hellhawks. But it's still a cool jacket, and I think collectors will definitely be lining up for something like this. Some guy came in with an actual World War II Enigma machine. These things are really cool, but I know the market is super thin. So I called in my buddy Will, see if he could help me out. You even got the right little light bulbs. Hey, what's, what's up, man? Good to see you. <laughs> what do you uh, got? Uh, a mystery wrapped in a riddle? Yeah, it's an Enigma machine. It's pretty cool. <laughs> coolest thing about these things is that they named it the Enigma. Right, right. That is cool. <laughs> if I had a dog, that's what I'd name him. I do have a dog. He's an idiot. <laughs> My name is Will Willis. I'm a former Army Ranger and Air Force pararescue man, and I specialize in military items. The hardest part of being in the military for me was getting a haircut every week. Nothing like having a baby slick head for four years makes you think that uh, hair is kind of nice. It's one of the coolest things that's ever been in the shop. It really is. Yeah, it is. It is a really cool thing, and it's really significant when you talk about being able to encrypt your messages to your generals and your soldiers. You know, having a machine like this that allows you to send those messages in secret is really a critical thing. And it was critical to us, the Allied forces, to be able to decipher these messages. And when we decrypted the machines, it shortened the war by two years. Yeah, this is like uber nerd cool. It really is. Germany's foreign policy was to conquer the world during World War II. So making them believe that their messages were encrypted in secret was critical towards winning that war in a shorter period of time. So which parts were missing when you found it? The warning plate, 
and the rotors. Okay, do we have matching serial numbers throughout? We do not. Okay, so how many rotors match the machine itself? None. Okay. A serial number wasn't what drove the process, the rotor number was. But the serial number drives price. Okay. <laughs> all right. I know the price of these things are all over the place. Right, the most expensive one went for over $200,000. We've got three matched rotors with serial numbers. They don't match the machine itself. The box doesn't have a serial number on it. We've got a recreated box. And considering what things have been selling for that are unrestored with matching serial numbers, I would price this at $70,000 altogether. Well, I think my price is fair. Yeah, because he was asking $149,300. Well, the most expensive one that ever sold was for $200,000. That one was in a movie. I think the more fair price is $70,000 for everything. Hmm. Well, thanks, man. You got it. I think that sellers get this perception that, like, I put in all this work. It's worth way more than what it really is. I'm going to go with Will on this one. I'd give you fifty grand for it. I can't do that. I mean, what is your lowest number? 115,000. Uh, we're way too far off. We just are. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right. This really sucks because the likelihood of another one coming in my shop is not good. But we are over 60 grand apart, and that's way too much ground to even try and cover. But you know what? I really did want that thing.